Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Please help me welcome our speaker tonight, Cherie, from the Fourth Dimension meeting Thursday night, 7.30 in York, Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Sheree, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Whoa, we got the mood lighting. That is awesome. <laughs> um, my sobriety date is May 19th of 2005. Um, I have a sponsor, and I talk to my sponsor still on a regular basis because I don't ever want to think I'm too sober to be sponsored. Um, I have women that I work with in the fellowship, and they are... Most of the 95% of the time, the joy of my life. The other 5% we're not going to talk about. Um, <laughs> and I do belong to a uh, home group, Fourth Dimension, Tuesday night, 7.30, downtown York. If you ever are in the area, we serve brownies. So please come down. We would love to have you. And, um, and it's a big group, and it's enthusiastic. And that was something that was important to me, um, because when I got sober, I didn't think that happiness and sober could kind of go hand in hand or or comfort and sobriety. Um, and I love that you guys say the set aside prayer. It's something I do a big book study at my house for the girls, for women on Sunday nights. And, um, and it's something that we start out every meeting with, um, because that's what I found AA. Um, when I came to AA is that I got a new experience. Um, I, um, I, No, well, my job is here tonight is to tell you a little bit about what I was like, what happened to me, and what I'm like now. And and truly what this story is, is a story of what drinking did for me, um, what drinking and my alcoholism eventually did to me, and how I got beat enough to come to AA and find the God of my own understanding, Um, because that's that's kind of the hit of what we do here, you know, and so I'll talk about God and I'll talk about all these things and steps and sponsorship because that's my experience is that that's how I got sober and happy. Um, so, um, before I get started, I would love to thank Sarah. I know she's not here, but, um, but I appreciate, I appreciate your hospitality. Thank you so much for welcoming me. Um, you guys have a great group and thank you, Heather, for coming along. Um, one of the girls I sponsor is my road dog. So she comes, <laughs> she comes a lot of places with me, um, which is, which is awesome. And, um, I should maybe also tell you that I have <clears throat> the start of a mild cold. And that is only significant in the fact that AA has given me the ability to suit up and show up regardless of how I feel about it. Because I am certainly not cured. I get a daily reprieve like anybody else. And don't think for a second that my head earlier today was like, yeah, I'm definitely feeling kind of warm. I probably shouldn't drive two hours tonight because, yeah. (laughs) And, um, and that's, again, like, I'm so alcoholic, I'm not cured, and, and I can tell you that no matter what my head said, it is a pleasure to show up for Alcoholics Anonymous. It really is. And AA and good sponsorship and the 12 steps have given me that ability. Um, so, so how did a nice girl like me end up in a place? <laughs> Don't roll your eyes. Um, how did a nice girl like me end up in a place like this? Um, oh my, I was born outside of Reading, PA, um, to a very loving, intensely loving family. Um, I was the baby. My brother and sister are considerably older than I am. They were 11 and 13 when I was born, so I was really the baby. Um, and they love to tell this story about, there's two stories my family have about me when I was little. The first one is, is that when I was just an infant, they would pop me in the middle of the table and just stare at me. And I was the center of the world because my parents were in their 40s. My brother and sister were teenagers. I was the last baby long after they thought everything was done with. And so I became the center of their world. And I seemed to feel like I should stay there forever. Um, So that's the one story they always tell about me. The other one they tell about me is that I must have been around four years old. And I put 
the empty milk carton back into the fridge because I wanted milk, but I didn't feel like throwing it out. And the guy who became my brother-in-law tells the story that he went to get some and turned to me and said, Tree, why would you put the empty milk carton back in the fridge? And I don't remember this, but he says, I didn't even skip a beat. I looked up at him and said, Andy, you just don't understand my way of living. And I walked away. <laughs> and... Um, and those are pretty, that's pretty char characteristic of how I was growing up. I was a weird kid. Um, by the time I was seven, I started lying to my own diary. I sort of felt like <laughs> I had, the story behind that is, is that I had read my sister's diary because I'm a great respecter of privacy. And um, I quickly figured out, even then, I knew that there was something different about me. And um, and I we didn't think alike. And so I read her diary, and I started tailoring my own diary. So it looked more like hers. <laughs> and, um, yeah, definitely remember doing that. By the time I was nine, I decided I wanted to grow up to be a Jedi Knight. I figured that it would be really helpful to be able to, um, like, force slap people if need be. Um, I, still, <laughs> I still think that talent would come in quite useful, and I definitely own a lightsaber. Um, so, <laughs> um, so, so that was me growing up, and I was just, I was a weird kid. You know, I was in my head a lot. Um, I was one of those people who... Um, I heard a girl say this a long time, and it rang true. Way before I found the drink, I lost myself in books because I was uncomfortable in the here and now. You know, I was. I was one of those people who spent a lot of time, even as a child, you know, kind of ruminating over the past or, or you know, daydreaming about the future. And for me, happiness was always at the 18th birthday. It was far away from where I grew up. It was when I got away from my family. I could never find happiness and comfort in the here and now. I just could not be fully present in the moment. And I got to AA and that's got, you guys told me that that's where God is. And that really we were only promised right now. You know, and that wasn't me. I just spent a lot of time somewhere else in my head. Um, and so <clears throat> my dad is a an alcoholic, and I can say that he comes into these rooms. Um, my dad got sober when I was two years sober, so in a couple of months he will have seven years and I will have nine, which again, that's truly grace of God. It really is. I I can't even explain that one because um, um, we are the textbook big drunk big book drunks like out of the big book. Um, and my mom growing up was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she had, she was diagnosed originally when I was nine. She had a reoccurrence of it when I was 15, and then she passed away when I was 19. And I tell you those things not because they make me an alcoholic, but because those were two really good excuses for me to fall back and drink the way that I wanted to drink. Because, because you didn't know how bad it hurt. Because you didn't know what it was like to grow up with an alcoholic father. Never mind the fact that I was utterly spoiled rotten. You just didn't know. You know, you don't know what it's like to have to watch your mom go through some of the medical treatments. You know, you don't know what it's like to grow up, um, watching, being going to, literally I went to kindergarten, my brother and sister went to college. Cause you don't know what that's like. You know, and, and the reality of it is, is that I don't need an excuse to drink. I drink because because it's as natural to me as breathing. It's unnatural for me to be sober. You know, I drink on days that end in Y. Um, because sobriety is uncomfortable for me when I am not recovered, when I'm just dry, um, when I haven't taken the actions, or when I'm not taking the actions as outlined in the big book. Um, but I didn't know any all of that at 12 when I took my first drink. And I know I like sh probably should have my membership revoked, but I don't remember my first drink. <laughs> um, yeah, I really don't. It was so such a part of my life. I cannot honestly tell you the first time that I took it. It was my dad drank all the time. He always had vodka and beer around. I stole sips out of it for as long as I could remember. Twelve is the first time I remember <laughs> getting good and slammed. And and what I remember was is that it set me free from a prison that I didn't even really know that I had been in. You know, and it wasn't until I got the contrast of the freedom of being drunk, 
when I could do anything, when I could look you in the eye and I could talk to you, and I wasn't so locked in fear about what you thought of me, um, you know, when I wasn't so uncomfortable over um, over situations going on around on around uh, around me, um, that I that I knew I had been in prison, but I was, and um, and I loved it, you know, and um, and I did it as as often as I could at twelve. Um, by the time I was by the time I was in high school, I had um, progressed onto other things, and I will give the disclaimer: I have a lot of respect for AA. I was brought up very well in it by a good sponsor, and I know the definition of an "I am the alcoholic" in the big book. I am the effects drinker, and um, and I heard this um, I heard this said at a meeting one time. So I please I do beg your pardon if I don't want this to offend you, but. When I was newly sober, I remember, I think I was three months sober, sitting in a meeting with my sponsor, a guy at the podium said that if you tried to solve your alcoholism with heroin, you might be an alcoholic. And I got that. (laughs) Yeah, I really did. I got that. Because for me, what happened is by the time I was 16, I had progressed to the underground club scene in Philadelphia. Um, And then by the time I was 18 years old, I drank every day. And... Um, and I under, when the gentleman, and I remember it was at Harbor City, when the gentleman said that, I understood that right down to my bones, because I, by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I was already paying consequences for my actions of drinking. And I was justifying it, like, I'm a teenager, this is what teenagers do, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I was already starting to pay consequences, and I needed to find, I was looking, already looking for something that would let me feel like I was drunk, without me losing control. And and I looked everywhere to try to find it, you know. Um, when I went off to college, but again, this was all still like, this was the good times for me. I was having fun. My first semester in college, I went up to college, and for Halloween, my costume was an alcoholic. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I swear this is true. Um, I would not have done this if I knew someday I would probably talk about it in AA. But... Um, <laughs> um, my um my roommates and I we decided to be alcoholics for Halloween. We got these T-shirts and we got the iron on letters and on the front it said Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work for me. On the back we wrote Rehab is for quitters. Um, we painted our faces yellow. I didn't know that years later I would turn yellow on my own. Um, you know we put circles under our eyes. I think at one point we had trench coats. We didn't have them by the end of the week, and we got forties and bags. And we were alcoholics for Halloween. That was our costume. And um, I must have had a really good time because I don't remember anything. But I do. I did years ago find a shirt, and it was covered in like beer and puke and wine and like a bunch of other stuff. And at some point, somebody must have gotten to me with a magic marker, and and that was that was how I drank. You know, and I loved it, and I had a good time with it, and um, and unfortunately, it turned on me. You know, and and you probably heard cliches are are cliche because they're true. And my drinking went from lots of fun to little problems to half and half to all problems and very little fun. And I don't even really like the word fun. It was relief. You know, by the time I was eighteen, nineteen, I was I was had lost the power of choice. I was drinking because I I could not choose anymore. When I take a drink, I don't know what's going to happen to me. You know, I really don't. I would love to tell you that um, that I could stop after two beers. It doesn't even sound like a good idea. You know, I really, it doesn't, I, that, there's no appeal to that in me. Um, and that's, that's that loss of controlling and enjoying. If I'm trying to control, I can't enjoy. If I'm enjoying, I don't come home for four days. I have proven it to myself over and over and over again. You know, and that's the difference. And that's what I was facing around 18, 19 years old. Um, so in a nutshell, the de- my downfall, what happened was, is that um, by the time, I, I think I told you I had progressed on to some stuff along with alcohol. Um, by the time I was 19, 20, I had dropped out of school to become an unlicensed pharmaceutical sales girl. I was... Um, <laughs> standing on a corner that I had no business being on, saying, what you need, Poppy? I got you. Um, (laughs) I was doing things that I had never thought I would do in order to drink, um, and all of that kind of came to a screeching halt on my first sobriety date, which was December 24th of 2002. Um, I never intended to keep it because the state police gave it to me. (laughs) 
Um, I got picked up by some very nice people who were dressed all in black and carried really big guns. And they um, they took me to jail, and then they took me. I, I played the game like women. A lot of times, women do, and I, you know, and cried. And it was because of a guy, and it was because of my mom. My mom had passed away at this point, um, you know, and I cried and did all these things and and played the game. And they they brought me to you guys, and I sat in your meetings and I read the steps and I knew that apology one <laughs> really well. And, um, and I did not have any interest in having a God of my own, my own understanding. I had always, um, I had always believed, but I didn't really know what God was. Early in my life, I was really difficult. My mom would want me to attend a religious service and I would tell her that I didn't feel God in those walls. Um, I'd never, in my first, in one of my rehab folders, um, the Brom report said that I was hostile to religion. Um, you know, and by that point I, I saw that God had taken my mom from me, you know, so I wasn't particularly interested in anything to do with your God. You know, um, he was, if anything, he was very, very far away from me and I, I wanted nothing to do with that. And, um, so that was... That was, uh, that was me and God. And I, I looked at the steps and I wasn't really interested. And I know now that I had well-intentioned people who were trying to carry a message to me. And the reason I know is because, and I don't know if any of you are like this, but at some point along the way, I kind of decided I was a tortured genius. I, um, cause I, I really, like, I wanted to be Hunter Thompson. Like, I wanted to be, you know, fear and loathing in Las Vegas, buy the ticket, take the ride, you know, that kind of thing. Um, uh, cause I, I was a writer, I am a writer, and so I had, I, I figured that was my, gonna be, I was gonna be Charles Bukowski, and, um, do all the kind of crazy stuff, and, uh, drive across Vegas, you know, the desert, and the big red car, anyways. Um, so I kind of decided all of that, and, um, and so when I was in, re when I'm in rehab or jail, what I do is I write a lot, because I can see again, and, um, so I was writing in, in, in my rehab journal from that time, and I'm in between me writing about my rehab boyfriend, which I quickly acquired as soon as I got in there. I'm writing about how they want me to go to meetings. They want me to get a sponsor. They want me to get a female sponsor, which I was particularly annoyed about. And they want me to do the 12 steps. And I just wasn't having it. Like, I just didn't. I was too, I was 20 years old. I was too young. I was too smart. I just didn't. I wanted nothing to do with it. And, of course, I didn't stay sober. And and what that did was it started a three-year downcline for me. Um I was to go back to jail um, a couple more times, I, an extended stay once, a couple months. I, I went back to jail. Um, I just ran my life in the ground, you know, I, and in that time, I, I tried a lot of the things the Big Book talks about for to control and enjoy my drinking. You know, I moved back home so that I could be with my family, and that didn't stop anything. It just gave them a front row seat to my destruction, you know. I um, I tried... Um, my dad took me to church for like an hour and I slipped out the back. You know, I, um, I tried psychology and I tried psychiatry and I tried, um, <laughs> oh gosh, what else? Self-help books and, um, uh, different kinds of medication. And I tried changing jobs and changing boyfriends and having a lot of money and having no money and having my dad do, um, you know, the screen door breathalyzer and arm check, you know, that kind of thing. Cause I had, I had moved on to using intravenously. Um, you know, and he wanted me to breathe on him to see if he could smell the booze and, and change everything. Like so many things, um, not only really to stay sober, but to see if I could finally at some point be happy. Because that was the thing. I was miserable. I just had this, um, my, my one great, my first great, great grand sponsor used to say that when I got sober, I had a little cloud of doom that followed me around. Um, cause it was true. I was just, I was just miserable. I had, I was utterly hopeless. I was utterly hopeless. I just couldn't see, I couldn't, I had, you know, at one time I had a lot of potential. You know what that means. Did not, I have done nothing. And um, I had a lot of potential. I just couldn't see any way out of it. And I, I kind of thought life was, um, you crossed off the days until you were lucky enough to die. And I couldn't stay sober. I was barely drawing a sober breath. And, um, and that lasted for about three years. 
And at the end of three years, I was on state per, uh, probation and um, still at my dad's house because I would run the street and come home, run the street, come home, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and a couple of notable things happened in the summer of 2004. Um, one of them being, it was two sort of separate, it was two occasions that occurred within a week. Um, number one, that, um, I, my probation officer came to me and said that if I gave him one more dirty urine, that I was going to do state time. And the second one was that I was drinking on late at night on a wet country road and I slammed my car head first into a telephone pole. And the funny thing is, I was talking about this recently, I remember the night that I, I got out and, you know, the car is like smoking, everything's a mess, and I had a cut on my head and, and headwinds yeah. bleed a lot, and I don't even care about the bleeding. I'm digging for the bottle because I don't want them to find it. You know, so my whole, my entire priority was to get my car cleaned out of any kind of incriminating evidence because I don't want to pick up another charge. And then I went and made myself throw up so that I could at least get some of that out of me. And then I was ready to walk back to the car and talk to the people who had stopped to see if I was okay. And then I was ready to call the police and stem the bleeding. But only then, because I protected drinking. Drinking was the only thing that made me feel okay. You know, in the beginning, it's what I did for fun. And in the end, it was um, I needed to drink so that I could face myself in the mirror for who and what I had become. So I could forget the dreams and goals that I once had so I could make day-to-day -day life bearable. And that's why I, that's <clears throat> how I kept drinking. Um, so after those two incidents, I thought it was a good idea for me to get sober. So I, um, you know, detoxed myself on my sister's couch. I, and I didn't touch a drink for about three months of sobriety or sobriety. And, um, and what I really was is that I went nuts. I was zonked out on pain meds. And, and by the way, I, I should say, I'm not knocking any of that stuff. I could not be honest or use it in the way I was supposed to because I could not be sober. And I, and I, I love the fact that you guys end the, be, the um, set aside prayer with please, please tell the truth, you know, see the truth because I thought that's so great because not only did I pray before I started speaking, but they're rooting for me too because I was a notorious liar. I would lie when the truth would do. You know, I joke about with my girls sometimes, even now, somebody's like, did you see that movie? I've always seen the movie, even if I haven't. You know, I just say yes. It flies out of my mouth, and I don't know why. Yeah. You know? um, but um, so, um, so back in September of 2004, I got sober for a little while, and I went nuts, and, um, and I was miserable. And during that time, what I did was I work a lot, and I, um, where we get home after I was a server and a bartender, so I could get you drunk and hate you and take your money. And, um, um, <laughs> and, uh, I would come home after, you know, a 10 hour shift. I would pour myself a bowl of cereal and turn on the TV and I would just sit and stuff myself until I could finally get to the point where maybe the, the thoughts of, misery and you know and he said this to me and what am I going to do tomorrow until those thoughts could slow down enough that maybe I could sleep for a little bit and that usually wouldn't happen until around 4 a.m. when the birds are chirping and it's not the chirp of like the early wake it's the chirp of I've been up all night and I hate my life and um and the only thing that's playing on tv is those girls going wild infomercials mm -hmm. and the continuous loop over and over and over again and you really hate it like I wanted to machine gun the birds um <laughs> Um, so, so that was me. And when I drank, it was like, and it was like a knot and my stomach opened up, you know, and, uh, and I felt like I could breathe and, and I was just, I just, sobriety didn't work for me and being dry didn't work for me. And I had thought I had tried AA, you know, a couple of years before. So AA didn't work for me and those other things didn't work for me. And so I decided I was just never going to be sober again. And what I did was, is I tried to control and enjoy my drinking for a little bit, and I ended up um, being asked to leave my father's house for the last time. And um, and as I said before, I had run the streets, I would come back. I would run the streets, I would come back. And um, this time it was different. Um, this time I stole a lot of money from him, and um, and I from his ATM card, I got a hold of it when he was drinking one night and took out a lot of money. And the next day, my brother said, we don't need you at home anymore. And I said, okay. And I left my keys and my cell phone at a turkey hill. And I went out and I lived on the streets. 
and I did what I needed to do in order to survive, you know, and I remember, I remember walking for hours because I had nowhere to go, you know, and I would sleep in abandoniums and in crack houses and, um, and I would do what I needed to do in order to get a drink. And every day I would come to, um, in on a park bench or in um in like some dirty room on some piss stained mattress and I didn't know how I was going to be able to get through another hour, much less another day of this. You know, and I would be jealous when I heard of people that they found dead. Um, because I just I couldn't I couldn't do it anymore. And that was my life. And that's how I thought I was going to die. And uh, and I had kind of come to terms with that. And on, on May eighteenth of oh five um, God had different plans. And, and that day that I woke up, it wasn't going to be like any other, you know, I had, um, I had made my way back to, um, I had made my way back to Reading cause I was, um, coming to in places like Perry, New Jersey, um, Perryville, Trenton, New Jersey, you know, and, and under the L stop in Kensington. I remember that one cause the L like woke me up a bunch of times. Um, I had made my way back to Reading. Um, I was just, again, like, had tried to clean myself up. I, I was staying with this, this girl and, you know, got myself respectable enough to go and get my old job serving and bartending back. And, um, and, um, on May 18th of 05, I woke up in a crack motel, um, with some people who did not have my best interests at heart. And I didn't know what happened to me the night before, but it wasn't good. And I got up and went down to make some money. And then, um, and then later that day I was going to go to that restaurant, not to work, but to take money out of the register so that I could continue to drink. And when I arrived at that restaurant, what I now know is God intervened in the form of the state police. Yeah. And at that time, I didn't think it was anything different. I was just going back to jail. And that had become a fairly common occurrence in my life. Um, and I didn't know at that point that I quit living my plan and I started living God's. Um, because what ended up happening was, is that I went to jail and I remember, I remember sitting in the courtroom and the charges weren't that bad. And the judge asked me if I had anyone to call and I told her, no, there's nobody left to call. And she asked me if I had an address and I didn't have one. Um, I couldn't even make one up fast enough, you know, and, um, and I just looked at there, you know, I'm looking at her, I'm looking at the phone and, and she put me in jail and I needed to be there. And, um, and from jail, my family found me in jail. From jail, I went to rehab, and from rehab, I came to York, PA. And <laughs> I didn't really know anything about York. I had been there once and hated it. <laughs> and um, and again, like I, my experience has become is that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And and you know, um, that God will use people if you're listening. You know, and, and that's my experience. Um, because when I came to York PA, I was put in one recovery house and then immediately taken out and put in another. And I was terrified. You know, I was sober for a little bit. I was miserable. I was scared. And, um, and God put me in this house with these two women that 12 stepped me and they're still sober members of AA today. And they carried a message to me of weight and depth, you know, and one of the things about these girls is that they were no BS, like they lived the program. And that's a really, for me, that's a really key component because it's one thing to stand up here and pay lip service to the program that saved my life, but it's a whole other thing to live it when I'm not in front of you guys. And if I sound passionate about it, it's because I am, because I've watched too many people drink and die because they can sound really good, but they can't walk the walk. You know, and I saw these women, they would get on, I would wake up, I shared a room with one of them, and she would get on her knees to pray. And um, I remember she tricked me. She told me she was going to take me to Turkey Hill and get me cigarettes, and she was 12-stepping me the whole way, like just talking to me about her experience. And she had already been through the steps. She was only sober about six more weeks than me, but she knew what to do with a new girl. You know, and she was 12-stepping me. And it... um. <laughs> Turkey Hill was like three or four blocks from our from our recovery house, but we were walking for like an hour, and I was I was like three years sober before I realized she tricked me. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so um, so she told us that me, you know, and I, I would see these girls. They would go to meeting and they would talk to women, you know, and they would sit up front and they were um, and they would pay attention and they would come up afterwards and thank the speaker. 
um, and they would clean up chairs, and they would throw away coffee cups, and they would talk to new girls outside, and they would call their sponsors on the phone, and at the end of the day, they would get on their knees again. And I saw them. They were living examples of the big book. And the funny thing is, is that they weren't doing it for me, but I was watching. I mean, they were, but it was, but it was vice versa, you know. Um, and, and I saw them and they were not, they talked about being where I had been, but they were not those girls anymore. And, um, and they introduced me to the woman who's still my sponsor today. And, um, and I love my sponsor and, um, love her in the way that, um, I am, um, that I am totally willing to listen to her even when I don't like what she has to say. Yeah, I really do. Cause I, I trust that God knows who I'm listening to. And, um, and I remember I asked her to sponsor me and she, she asked me if I was an alcoholic and willing to go to any lengths. And I didn't know what either of those things meant, but I do, I have stood in enough courtrooms to know the sound of the yes questions, you know, the ones that you have to answer yes to, because otherwise they're not going to unlock those cuffs. And so (laughs) I knew when she asked me that those were yes questions and I needed to say yes. And, um. And so she, she, I said yes, and she started taking me on this journey, and we did one, two, and three fairly quickly. And, um, and it was right around the time of my third step that I started to believe, because I didn't believe. She told me, she asked me if I was willing to do these things regardless of what my head said, and I said, sure, because what else do I have to lose? And I have to tell you that my motives were not always great. Sometimes I did them because I wanted to look good. Sometimes I did them because I had nothing left to lose. Sometimes I did things because I wanted to prove her wrong. Because I wanted to go and do something and then come back and be like, you were wrong. It didn't make me stop thinking about myself. And, um, and, and so what I ended up in AA is with a God that does not care what I think. He cares an awful lot about what I do. And, and I am forever grateful for the fact that regardless of what my head says, my feet have always continued to move. Um, and, and I know that that makes me blessed. It really does. Um, so we did one, two, and three quickly. And around the third step, I started to believe. And I'll tell you why. My sponsor, like all good sponsors, told me the truth and pissed me off. And um, I was sitting outside on the, the bus bench waiting for the bus to come through outside my recovery house. And, um, and my head is going crazy. Because I don't want to listen to her, but for some reason I think I have to. Thank God I didn't have, like, couldn't figure out that it was optional or something. I don't know. Um, you know, so my head is going nuts and I'm going back and forth and, you know, I don't want to do this anymore and this is ridiculous and well, maybe she's right and what do you feel to lose? Blah, 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 blah. And I'm looking down the street at certain places that I have already scoped out with the keen alcoholic mind. And I'm looking at the bar that's on the next corner, you know, and then somewhere another voice in the back of my head is going, oh, my God, you're flunking AA, Sheree. What is wrong with you? You know, (laughs) and um, and and that's how my head's going. And in the midst of that storm, something that you guys taught me came to me. And I, I said, I, now, I will never forget, this is the prayer. I said, God, if you're out there and I don't think you are, can you please send me an obvious answer on the next five minutes that I should stay sober and stay in AA? Because otherwise I'm just going to get drunk. And in the next five minutes, a sober member of AA pulled up and was like, hey, do you want to ride? Is something going on? You look upset. You know, and for me, I was in. You know, that was it. I said a prayer, and, and I think my God knows when um, when I need the force of a sledgehammer. I have also more recently in my experience come to believe that, that God does answer prayers. But he, for me, he answers them in his time and his way, and it is my job to look for it. And, um, and then as I pray and I ask God to show me and just give me the strength to carry it out, that um, I'm not going to be done with something until it's finished shaping me. And, and that's just things that I've kind of learned during my, my time in the program. Um, but that day on in um, in the hot August sunshine, I didn't know any of that. And I said a prayer, and God showed up. And I remember that night I went home and I called my sponsor, and I was like, I talked to God, <laughs> and um, and she's like, What do you say? <laughs> And I think I told her that I would go with her to meetings or something like that. Probably what it was is that she wanted me to go to meetings where I would get recovery, and I wanted to go to meetings where there were cute boys. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, so that was kind of my experience. And you know, we we did a, a fifth step not too much longer and uh, later, and 
And that was my first fist up, quite the experience. It was super hot out. Again, it was August. And, um, and we were, we and everybody else in York and their 20 kids and nine cousins were all at the community pool, which is where my sponsor decided to do my fist up. And, um, and because it's hot, they're all in the pool except for my sponsor and I and this sort of pack of children that's running around us. Um, so, my first fist up experience was me yelling my fist up at my sponsor um, over the pack of children in the hot August sunshine. Um, and for a minute after doing that, my after we were finished, my sponsor looked over and said to me, so what's going on over there? What are you thinking? And I had to tell her nothing. And she was like, sure, that's serenity. And I didn't know. I couldn't recognize it. I hadn't had that. And it had been a long time since I had peace of mind, chemical, chemical or natural. You know, it just, the drink didn't work for me for a really long time, but I kept trying over and over and over again, just like the definition of insanity. Um, so after that, you know, she sent me out to do six and seven and, um, and didn't know what a character defect was, wasn't going to ask, um, found out later that pride was one of them, (laughs) um, you know, later on, six and seven really became the crux of my sobriety because those character defects, they will start flying. And I have a, I have a group of girls right now who are in that kind of like year one to year two range. And I had like, I was emotional sobriety, crazy kind of stuff going on. I was, that thing in my head was telling me, you have time sober. You shouldn't feel like this. You know, um, I wasn't doing 10, so I couldn't be doing 11. I was sponsoring a lot of people because that made me look good, you know, but, um, but I was slowly getting miserable in AA. And, um, and it's because come to find out I wasn't doing all of it, you know, and half measures availed me no peace of mind. That's for sure. And I was lucky I didn't take a drink. And actually, again, that was God that showed up because, um, I was talking, I think God does give kind of grace periods. Um, because for me, I remember like a year and a half sober, I was standing in a park that I had no business being in because I just wanted to say hello. And, um, and, and my phone rang and it was somebody from AA, you know, and again, my pride was so great. I couldn't tell that person where I was, but it was enough to get me back in the car, you know, and thank God shortly after I did another fist step. And, um, and really took a look at the character defects that have been there well before I took a drink. All that sort of fear and, um, and jealousy and, and self-hatred and, um, pride and all those things that have, have built a wall around between you and me. And, um, and I heard a speaker one time put it that he is a God who's like a gentleman. He will not come where he is not invited. And I, I got that, and I wasn't inviting God into all areas of my life, and it was time. It was time for me to grow, and um, and I didn't know that, but it's what it was, and um, and and that became my experience. Um, back to the first time I went through the steps. Uh, after I did six and seven, I went, um, I went and you know made my eighth step list, and. I have to say my first amends was really easy. It was kind of one of those ones where they pat me on the back and tell me to stay sober. But um, but my second one, my sponsor told me it was time to make amends to my mom. Now, my mom passed away when I was 19 years old. And, um, and I was deep with inactive alcoholism then. And she... The weekend, my mom, I got a call on Friday that my mom was going to last the weekend. And I got a lot of booze, and I went down there to be with her. And by Sunday, my sister and I were both there. And we, she was in a coma, and we were, you know, telling her it was okay to go and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then Sunday, my booze was out, and they let my sister and I go home to take a shower. And I went to my bar. And, um, and that's where I was when my mom died a couple hours later. And for a really long time, I thought my mom hated me for who and what I had become. And over the time of me drinking, I thought she was watching me. You know, every time I did something slimy, um, every time I couldn't, did something I could not forgive myself for, um, I felt like she was there too. And I hated who and what I had become. And, um, my sponsor told me that it was time for me to go and make amends for the daughter that I had been. 
And so I went down to her grave. Uh, and I did other things, too. That's just a small amount of what I had did, done to my mother as she was passing away. And um, I went down <clears throat> to make, to, and sat by the grave, and um, I started to cry. And I said what I was told, instructed to say by my sponsor. And I just sat there, and I started talking to her. And I walked away from that amends, not like lightning flashed or I saw ghosts or something like that, but <clears throat> my heart was literally on fire. <laughs> Not literally, but it was, you know, it was on fire. It really was. And, um, and, um, and I was light. I mean, I just, my, I did not feel burdened by it. I didn't feel like my mom hated me anymore. You know, I didn't, I didn't carry it. And, um, and I was at peace. I really was. I was at peace with it. And if that had been all that she had given me, it would have been enough. You know, but a couple of years later, I graduated from college in sobriety, and I became a writer and a journalist. And um, about a year, I guess it was a a year out of being out of college, I was working for this magazine, freelancing for a magazine, and they asked me if I wanted to write a story for National Breast Cancer Awareness Month um, in memory of my mom, urging women to seek out that kind of health care. And, um, and so I wrote it. And I remember the day I was writing the story about my mom and her life. Um, I'm like bawling. And my sponsor returned my phone call and she's like, what's wrong? And I told her what was going on and she gets teary and she's like, isn't it amazing what AA has given us? And, um, and so I wrote that story and it came out and I got, you know, phone calls and emails and letters and things like that. And, um, and it occurred to me that I was finally able to be the woman my mom would have wanted me to be, which I hadn't been able to be pretty much for a really long time. And, and I can't take credit for that. That was what you guys taught me. Um, and I, um, tons of amends later, um, I am absolutely free. I really am. And I, I can't tell you how many times those kind of coincidences have sort of happened. Um, a quick story. I was sponsoring this girl in, in Lancaster, and I had come to do her fist step, and I had to pick her up at the mall there, which is called Park City. And I was telling her how every time I came to Lancaster, I was looked over my shoulder for these people. And um, these two roommates that I had, that I, a couple roommates I had that I really did dirty. And we were talking, we're driving back to her house, we couldn't find a parking spot, because she lived in one of those, um, these, like, sort of high-rise buildings in the middle of town, and we're talking, still can't find a spot. Finally, 20 minutes later, um, we are walking in the building, and my roommates from the past are walking out. You know, and, like, I can't make this stuff up. Like, my experience is, is that if you are looking, God will show up, you know, and I was able to make amends on the spot. And they didn't, they don't want anything to do with me, but that doesn't matter because I cleaned up my side of the street. I made amends. I can go and I don't have to worry when I go to Lancaster. You know, and that's, that's what we do. I am of maximum service to God and to my fellows. Um, so just a ton of stuff. And in terms of 10, 11 and 12, I, today I do, I do my best to live there. You know, I really do. I don't like pain. I don't really have a high tolerance for it. Um, and so I, I, you know, I do the four and four as the big books laid out. Um, in terms of the 11 step, I was really lucky to get sober that taught with people who taught me to see God in all forms. And, um, I've uh, been doing a lot more. I, you know, it's funny because meditation makes me feel the best. And yet I've always prayed, thank God. But meditation makes me feel amazing, and it's the first thing my head will easily dismiss if I'm busy, you know. And I like being busy because it makes me feel important. It's just sneak out. Um, but I've been doing a lot more meditation and spiritual reading lately because because I'm not done seeking. Because I don't think that at 31 I'm my set my life is set in stone. I was talking on the phone with a girl on the way down here quickly, and um and I I didn't drink small and I cannot handle mediocre sobriety. I really do. Like I, I, I have seen, like I want the fairy tale, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as I'm willing to invite God into it and constantly ask him to show me and to guide me. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of 12, um, I, I sponsor a ton of women, as I said, 
they're a joy. They crack me up. And I really, like, it really is amazing, you know, um, to be able to hold their hands and, and watch their children come back into their lives and to watch them go to school and to watch them sort of get stuff back and to see them grow into the women that I know God intended me to be. Uh, <laughs> Heather and I were talking on the way down here. She, <laughs> about, um, what, watching her grow in sobriety because she like traumatized me as a sponsee. I'm sorry. <laughs> she really did like watching her drink. And then, um, and then, you know, and now I get to go on the other side and talk about her sponsees with her, you know, and what a gift that is really. And, and practicing principles in all my affairs, uh, my sponsor taught me that my job is to suit up and show up and to be of service. And amazingly enough, um, when I do that, <laughs> Things work out really, really well. They really do. I don't, I have stuff going on, but I don't really have big deals, if you think about it. I don't have anything that incapacitates me. I don't have anything I won't get out of bed for. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't really, I have faith that, I like to call it embracing the suck. Um, Sometimes, sometimes stuff sucks. And I take the action anyways, and I come out on the other side. You know, and I I talk to my girls sometimes about how when I was newly sober, it seemed like the prayers were answered so quickly. And yet the affairs that I were practicing principles in were so small. I mean, they were like the, like, who stole my dry hair dryer at the recovery house type of affairs, you know? Mm -hmm. And now it's like I'm asking God to show me, like, what to do with my career and my life and things like that. And, um, and, and the funny thing is, is that I'm pretty much having fun along the way. It really is. I get a kick out of my life. Um, so a little bit about what I'm like now, briefly. Um, stayed so, obviously stayed sober and got the outside stuff back. So came into AA with a trash bag and I now have all the trappings of the average American life, the house, the car, the, um, you know, the cell phone, whatever else, um, that, that I needed. Um, I, um, AA has, I met a guy in AA, boy meets girl in AA campus, right? <laughs> of course. And, um, and he did not stay sober. And when he drank, I let him go drink because he was God's kid rather than my, before he was my boyfriend. And I let him do what he needed to do. And when I came back, I let him be sponsored the way he needed to be sponsored. And when we started dating again, we did it with our sponsor's blessing and guidance. And, um, and he's my husband today. And we've been married for, th- uh, three years now, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and I can tell you that I kind of suck at being married. Um, I am not really great at, inv- I'm really good at being of service to you up to a point. When you start crossing what I want, then I get a little, it's a little difficult. And I can tell you that through the principles in AA and good sponsorship has enabled us to grow and continue to stay married. I know that sounds really funny, but we're not one of those, we're not one of those couples. We are bullheaded alcoholics who both want what we want. And, um, and, and thank God for the principles of AA because it has brought us back to a place where we look not for what's good for one of us or two of us, but what, or one of us, but what's good for the both of us. And, um, and that stuff I had no idea. I was not a relationship kind of girl, didn't want one, thought they were a lot of trouble. You know what I mean? Mostly because I had to share my booze with you. Um, but, um, but you know, that's what, that's what it has given us. Um, I could go on, you know, friends and, and my family quickly came back after I made amends to them. And, um, and I not only did a verbal, I did a living amends. And so they know now that when they call me that I will be there. And, um, on Friday I was in King of Prussia with, um, my niece celebrated her 16th birthday and the thing she wanted the most for her birthday was for her mom and her aunt to take her shopping at King of Prussia. And this is a 16 year old when I like it blows my mind because when I was 16, I wanted to get hammered on a hill. Do you know what I mean? But that's what she wanted was for her mom and I to take her to King of Prussia. And we did. And I was there on time and we had a great time. You know, um, what a has, uh, a has given me the ability to suit up and show up and go to work. And again, it was something I could always do, but I can actually work now instead of just kind of exist and take your paycheck. And um, and <clears throat> so what had ha- what has happened to me is that 
when I had a year sober, my sponsor said I had unfinished business, and um, I was kicked out of school for some of those unlicensed pharmaceutical sales. And my sponsor told me that I needed to take care of unfinished business. And so I jumped through the hoops, and I made the amends I needed to make, and I went back to school, and I graduated. And um, I wanted to be, I always wanted to be a writer. That's was that whole tortured genius thing. And um, I decided I was going to be a journalist. I got this internship, and then they hired me at this paper. And I was stoked because this was my plan. And a couple months into me working there, like a lot of journalism things, they went under. A lot of print journalism went under, and I was pissed and um, because my plan didn't work. And I moped around for a couple months, which doesn't really like me, but I was just so, like, I... I was just, that was my plan. I was so attached to it. And, um, and I have found that when things fall apart, they actually could possibly be falling better, together better in the God's plan. And, um, God's plan is always better than mine because my sponsor is loving enough to tell me that I need to get over myself and I need to start asking God what he wants for me, not what I telling him what I want for myself. And, um, and so I went back to school and I got a master's degree. And then I started teaching college. And I get really <laughs> tripped out sometimes. I know it's, it's not bragging. Sometimes I stand in class and, I, and I'm and i talking, and afterwards the students come up and they will say, Professor Beam, and they'll ask me about something. And I'll have this moment of the time in 2005 when I was digging food out of the trash to eat. And I don't know how I got from standing next to the trash can to teaching freshmen about literature. Um, except for the fact that that was what you guys taught me and gave me, you know, and, and think, and a God giving willingness. I really don't know how you get from there. I really don't. I, I, I hear some of my, I've lost a ton of friends, of course, in the program. And every time I, I hear about, they found another one with a bottle in their hand and a needle in their arm. I know that it probably should have been me. And then I go off and I, and I don't really know except for the fact that what I need to do is keep showing up because at some point somebody will come in and they will say, I want to give this thing a try. Um, and and it, so, again, my biggest problems today are the fact that, um, that I'm applying to PhD programs and I don't really know if I'll get in. And you know what? Regardless if I get in or not, God is in charge. You know, and that's my biggest problem today as opposed to did somebody else take a bite out of this hamburger before I got it out of the trash? You know? So, um, so, and, and I could go on. Those are the outside things. You know, they really are. I still became, I, um, I'm still a writer also and I, I get to publish and like, I don't, like, it blows my mind sometimes. I don't know how my dreams came true in AA. It wasn't the path that I was supposed to take, and yet it was exactly the one that I needed. Um, and I, I just sit back sometimes floored. Like, I don't, I don't get it. And, and this is all at 31. Like, I, I am so excited to see what else is in store. You know, and I, that's not to say that I'm not going to have pain at some point. But I don't, I don't believe in a God so loving today as to give me pain without purpose. I know I get shaped, you know, and I get moved. And, that's, and those are not bad things. My head just looks at the situation and assigns it a judgment value. You know? Um, and, and regardless of the outside stuff, because I did, you know, I've lost things in sobriety too. I watched my husband drink. I watched other, you know, I've watched people die, all this other kind of stuff. Um, AA has given me the ability to, to suit up and show up, to have peace, to look myself in the mirror, to find meaning in my life. I mean, really, what else was I meant for? But I need meaning and purpose. Um, and to, to come in here with you guys and to see miracles happen every day. And I have been fortunate enough to travel. I like to travel and do all this kind of stuff. And, and I can tell you, regardless of where I've been, drunk or sober, A is the only place I know where I can come and I can literally see walking miracles. So thank you again for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.